All right. I always hate following Sam because he's already told my story, so I should just stop now and just answer his questions. But I spent some time putting these slides together, and by golly, you're going to have to watch them. So I've got a lot of the same data as you might to guess. First off, I want to say that I'm really going to focus on one particular species. I'm a single-minded kind of person. I can't think more than one or two species at a time. So I'm really going to focus on eastern red cedar, juniper, Virginia, in my talk. Um, also want to acknowledge some long-term colleagues of mine, uh, John Blair and Alan Knapp. Uh, what I'm going to do is give a little introduction. I'm really going to focus in first on the patterns of expansion that has occurred in northern Flint Hills because I think you need to know the patterns, the expansions, uh, before we can talk about the consequences. I'm really going to re-show Sam's slides so to show that we do read the same literature um, and we show the same things on that. Um, then I'm going to end up with some, what, some questions. I think Sam really set the, uh, the tone for that and also really we're getting to that point we need to start doing some extreme things. This nuclear idea, I kind of like that idea. And I'm, I'm going to be very biased. I'm going to talk about a system that I'm familiar with, but since I was squeezed between the Oklahoma State crowd, I knew I had to throw in some data from them, so I've stole some of their data as well because they've done some excellent work and they filled in some nice gaps that we haven't been able to do. Number one, just like Sam said, this is occurring global. You can go to South Africa, go to South America. These people come and they talk about the same thing. Woody plants are taking over grasslands worldwide. Bond from South Africa says it's CO2. Global CO2, we're all screwed. Global CO2 is going to increase woody plants. That's the global driver. We need to start focusing on that. I, on the other hand, really think that these global drivers, this global change, I mean, can be done or accomplished with a series of very different local drivers that are pertinent to a particular system. And then something I think we need, really need to decide or discuss is I've been doing this for an incredibly long time. I make Sam look like a youngster. And I always wonder if that data that we're collecting, gleaming from the literature from times past, can we continue to use those same data in this ever-changing global environment? And that's something that we need to really consider from that. Again, this idea of potential causes, I really like this green glacier. I think that's an appropriate term. I came up with lignification many years ago. That has died away. Ingle stole the thunder with the green glacier, and I think that's an appropriate term because that is the Great Plains is being transformed right before our eyes. It's the most change that's going to occur since the last glaciation. And in our particular part of the world, woody plants is a threat to tall grass prairie conservation. I'm preaching to the choir here, but in our areas we have a variety of things going on. We have the typical gallery forest expansion. These are the trees that have probably been there since European settlement uh, first came in. This is a permanent water supply area. Uh, those things are literally starting to spread like amoebas across the landscape. In addition, Last 20 or 30 years, we're getting more common woody plants, in particular around Kanza, uh, dogwood, East, uh, Cornus drummondii is starting to expand. And of course, eastern red cedar is kind of the focus on that. So we're really being threatened in a lot of different ways. And I throw this slide, it's kind of old now, but remind us that grasslands across the globe, I think are endangered of going away. I really, at, well, I was naive at one time thinking since row crop agriculture has gotten their maximum level in North America, I think we could have saved it, uh, particularly the tall grass prairie. Now with all the biofuels, energy levels, and coupled with increasing uh, woody plant expansion, I really wonder if we're going to have grasslands in the future. And it's already recognized that they are some of the most endangered ecosystems in, in the world based upon what's set aside. Everybody talks about uh, uh, rainforest, but you talk about biodiversity, but when you talk about areas saved, grasslands 
are really in danger of going away and we need to start doing something quickly. Basically, I think Sam again stole my thunder. The expansion of red cedar, it, everybody knows what's causing it. It's a change in land use change, uh, land management, particularly when you reduce fire coupled with overgrazing, you can get an expansion of juniper in that grassland. That's, we, it's not rocket science anymore. We know what's going on. It's also occurred relatively recent and so that we can go back in time, we can use aerial photographs, and everyone has done this. Sam showed some examples. You can take different parts. We've done this in Riley County around the northern part of the Flint Hills. Same thing in Oklahoma. You take aerial photographs. You can go there, and you can actually sample areas that are now grassland, areas that are now juniper, and we know that in 50, 80 years ago that they were grasslands. So we can really start doing a comparison, and this is where we can get a lot of those consequences that Sam was talking about. Again, to illustrate, this, you know, Sam should have given my talk, just kept on talking, but this expansion has been rapid. In the northern Flint Hills, it can occur in as little as 40 years. You can just go to the photographs, or you take fire away from that system, you get a closed canopy uh, eastern red cedar forest. This, we've done this in a variety. It's about a 6% increase every year on that. And then just like Sam said, there are some trees in, the pre in, in, in that landscape, but they do spread very rapidly. In addition, what's going on, at least on Kanza, where we are looking at a smaller scale this is a study that uh, we started in 1981, where Lloyd Holbert, the original director, went out with mylar sheets and recorded the, all the woody plants that were on that working cattle ranch when it was deeded over the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and we took an, an area, burned it every year, very little woody vegetation. Burn it every four years, you get an increased amount of Cornus drummondii, the shrub species come in, and you have an area that's only burnt one time during this 30 year time frame. You get this incredible increase in woody vegetation from the shrubs. And this is what the other thing you have to remember too when you talk about juniper expansion. This is just one watershed that's only burnt once. This was in 81, a few woody plants usually restricted to the draws, the streams on this. Up in 2002, all those red dots are juniper seedlings, literally distributed at random. But there's also other woody plants coming in, honey locusts, American elms expanding, and even cottonwood is able to expand out in this particular landscape. So when we talk about expansion of eastern red cedars, there's other trees that's coming in there as well in some certain places. And if you put that in now a bar graph and these sampling points over time, uh, at Kanza we never have a wildfire. We always have a fire that exceeds our expectations. Uh, and this is with that particular year when we really exceeded expectations and burnt the whole bloody place. Uh, but it was not able to wipe the cedars completely off. Then afterwards, we've had this explosion. And just as Sam has talked about, this is an ungrazed area. And this is an ideal settlement area for those uh, seedlings to establish. You have a big layer of duff for the litter layer. You start pulling that apart, and you can see little seedlings all across the landscape. This number, about 1,200 cedars on that, are the ones that we can see above the ground. I can't convince the students to get on their hands and knees and count everything because they're too busy picking all the ticks off them while they're going through this landscape. So what's going on in the region? This is some work that we were able to do scaling up, went up to the Flint Hills, the northern part of that eastern part of Kansas, using remote sensing, going to a bigger scale, that kind of rectangle up there is Kanza. All those dots are eastern red cedars that we have established using remote sensing. Um, 
Oh, thank you. All those ones in there. And you can see that this parse down there, very few red cedars. So the question is what? And I, the graduate student came in. Everybody's heard this story. I said, well, it's got to be soil type. It's got to be rainfall, precip. It's got to be something. What's going on? And he came in and showed me one day and, and, and uh, kind of blew us away that it's not any of those things. It's social economic factors. If you look at the increase of population over time, basically these counties are growing faster than the ones down here. And this is a very relatively small increase over a, uh, about a 20 year time frame. This isn't even a subdivision down here in Florida that, that gums up. We're talking about a very small increase of that. So what's, what's going on there? And as you might guess, using some data that some colleagues of mine over in geography department took over this incredibly long time span and looked at the burn frequency that's occurring over the entire Flint Hills, all the way from Oklahoma up here to the Nebraska border. You, these are all the different burn frequencies. Chase County, this is the, the county when you talk about Flint Hills, large ranches, annually burn, double stock rotation. This is just a classic thing very high fire frequency up here in the northern part where we saw all those eastern red cedars you take away fort riley here uh, which if you want to have a lot of fires you can have a bunch of 20 year olds with artillery shoot off in the prairie and you're going to have a lot of fires going on but this is all lower fire frequency lots of high fire frequency down south following that thing and this is not an easy thing to do because one thing I want to make sure you understand and something we are really bad about, myself included, we think of fire as a binary function. It's either burnt or it's not. And if you go out to a landscape, particularly one that's grazed, you know, they might have some chart and might have, we don't have any idea of fire intensity that's going on out here. So that's something that's also, I think, is really important that uh, I was going to talk about earlier. Again, another example that Sam uh, illustrated, uh, I just made it bigger and more simple so I can understand it, is once you take away the fine fuel, you start reducing this fuel. This is an example of some pastures. Um, the ungrazed areas, you have a lot of fuel, you can get a lot of red cedars getting killed. But up to a point, you know, they get up to a certain height no matter what kind of fine fuels you're going to get, uh, you're not going to be able to catch those on fire. But if you overgraze it, you're going to really set up the place for establishment of eastern red cedars. Another uh, example, again going back to road remote sensing, an area that is um, very dear to me because this is an area that uh, just north of Manhattan uh, on the west side of a reservoir, we're able again using remote sensing over about a 30 year time frame, MSS data, recent TM data coming up with algorithms, we can calculate how much of that area is eastern red cedar and do this all by percentage uh, cover and then subtract the two. And these are the hot areas where eastern red cedar is occurring. So what's, occur what's, why is red cedar expanding in these areas? Is it fire? Is it grazing or it's other? And you know this is a multiple choice exam. And I've always talked about fire and grazing. My students always talk about unfair test. And of course, you know it has to be another factor going on you need to consider. And this is what I call one of the biggest threats, at least in our area, that go along with that earlier thing is subdivisions. People like trees, if you're going to get close to retirement or you're tired of getting up every morning and trying to chop hose and, and take care of the cattle, you really want to uh, retire wealthy. You can overgraze, allow a lot of cedars to come in, and developers actually pay more money for this kind of land because they can carve out, this is a place uh, just right outside Manhattan, 
another view of this. Eastern red cedars, deciduous trees. This is a neighborhood that they run me out at night. These are very expensive home areas. So this is another thing you got to think about in eastern red cedars. Not only is it fire and grazing, but there's this social economic factors coming in that people are favoring cedars because it is that uh, nice environment for new homes. And the county loves this. They're going to get a lot more in tax revenue than they are from, this, from that poor guy raising cattle. So they think it's a win-win for everyone, which is why I'm really worried that grasslands, you know, really threaten to lose them. Again, showing Sam, you know, Sam did all this work, showed all this earlier, basically showing the difference. What are the consequences? Why do we care? I'm going to kick, continue kicking this horse um, uh, even further past dead. As eastern red cedars come in, species diversity go down. You get in a species underneath the cover, you get a couple of species, and one of those species is eastern red cedar. So this, you know, usually you're down just to very few uh, uh, species underneath this canopy. Ryan has done a lot, lot better job of, of doing this, quantifying not only the total species, but it's a total reduction of all of them. Whether you're talking about the Forbes, the C3 graminoids, or the dominant C4 grasses, they're all showing this decrease uh, with the expansion of eastern red cedar. Again, not surprising, but we have a lot of solid data to show this. And again, if you're talking about birds, some birds are going to increase. For example, if you're a cedar uh, waxwing uh, type of person, you can see that you get an increase. And this is probably between the cedar waxwings and American robin. Those are the culprits spreading the seeds. Cedar waxwings actually have a, developed a, a nice liver to handle the, uh, uh, the built up of the alcohols that occur when you eat those juniper berries. They are not as impacted by other birds. Some birds can actually eat so many juniper berries, they're feeling kind of good. But the cedar waxwings has an enlarged liver. They're able to digest these seeds. They're well adapted to eating these fleshy seeds. Other bird species uh, go down, and Sam showed this earlier. If you just look at the grassland birds, and grassland birds are every indicator, breeding bird survey, uh, the Christmas bird counts, et cetera, all grassland birds across the Great Plains are showing incredible decline. And just as Sam said, how many times can I say that, uh, that these uh, trees are causing bird populations to decrease over time. Now we go to the ecosystem consequences. This is some summary of a whole lot of data. There's going to be an exam to see if you got all these numbers correct. Uh, but basically what happens, you change tall grass prairie, a grassland, to an area that stored most of its carbon below ground to a system that is storing most of their carbon above ground. Duh. You, growing trees, you have a lot more things above ground than you have below ground. And also, you're really changing the soil respiration. So you're really having a dramatic impact on the carbon cycling in this particular system. And this is looking at an area just 40 to 60 years after tall grass prairie, you get these tremendous changes. The same thing occurs with nitrogen. You go from an area that's relatively starving for nitrogen to an area that has accumulated a lot of nitrogen into the canopy. You're changing this entire uh, root complex, changing the carbon soil nitrogen. So you're not only changing the community above the ground, the birds and et cetera, you're also changing the invertebrates below ground when you're changing this from a grass land to a forest. But surprisingly, what's interesting is if you go below ground and you look at the nitrogen, uh, the total nitrogen pools are about the same, 
the extractable nitrogens is about the same, and the mineralization rates are, are more or less the same. What you're doing is just putting this carbon, I mean this carbon, this nitrogen above ground. And so you can see some of the implications, increased nitrogen flux coming into the system, how this might also change the system. The other thing uh, that we've been working on is looking at this above ground change over time and productivity, stretching it out to over 80 years. And this doesn't imply that you go from a grassland to a shrub island to a juniper. This is just kind of putting it on a scale. And so, uh, but you can see over time the grams per meter square, at least in our part of the world, a very productive system, about 500 grams per square meter. You get this invasion of Cornus drummoni, tremendous change in the carbon, but for, for a very relatively short time. But then the junipers uh, also have this change, and you're literally, what we try to think is you can literally have three states, steady states. You have a grassland, you can have shrub islands, and you can have uh, going on to this eastern red cedar forest. The other thing, stealing this again from the Oklahoma folks, when you put a bunch of trees on the landscape, what does that do to the eco-hydrology? The water flowing out of this system, a vital ecosystem service that the prairies, the grasslands really change. Most of our water goes, comes from the aquifers in the Great Plains. We need to have this clean water for water storage, drinkability. Right underneath the canopy, the, the cedars literally creates a hydrophobic layer. Water will flow off a lot faster. However, that means it, the water can't percolate down into the groundwater. And so if you look over here, excellent work being done shows that in a grassland site, you get stream flow, you get the cedars or other woody vegetation come in, you can see this tremendous decrease in the amount of flow coming out of that stream, suggesting that that water is not getting down when you go down to the bottom of those catchment in the bottom of those watersheds. So hopefully I can kind of talk about some of the consequences. This is kind of a, a, a chart that kind of sums up some of the things I've talked about. Uh, productivity above ground, you're talking about two to three times. Plant biomass, the uh, uh, CNN, you can change those from a factors of 10 to 20 times. Soil flux, you get an incredible decrease once those woody plants um, come in. Uh, soil carbon storage, uh, you know, the, uh, it's a lot more in grasslands. The root tissue quality goes down, litter composition, little change in soil nitrogen availability, and of course a major change in eco-hydrology is really having a large uh, number of consequences. And again, trying to put this into uh, this system that I try to think of because you, you can't just focus in on junipers, you gotta look at other woody plants. So I put in some, uh, uh, what I think some of the major uh, consequences going on here trying to, and this is just my bias in picking them. If we would have everybody sitting around here, we could come up with different uh, major consequences. Um, and also, kind of a summary system. Uh, not surprising, when you go from grasslands, for example, on the roots, you go this fibrous to the taproot deep. The cornus drum and I, we really don't know exactly. Some of our isotope data suggest that they are getting the deeper soil water, but they also have shallow roots, and so there might be some competition going on. And this part right here, this response to fire, if you want to keep uh, it in grasslands, you have to have a high fire frequency, and juniper is the easiest woody plant there is to control, at least in a small scale. It's just fire, just burn the bloody thing. It can't tolerate fire, so it's a relatively easy one to do. And then again, these last ones, we've got to come up with some reason why people care. You can talk about plant species richness, or you can talk about grassland bird declines if uh, you're so inclined. The other thing that I want to kind of indicate is that 
going back is that we're living or we're experiencing an ever-changing uh, world. Uh, very recently, some folks at Arkansas were able to develop the longest continuous daily record for temperature in the Americas for Manhattan, Kansas, using data from uh, some observations that have been collected at the fort and also since uh, Fort Riley, which is right outside Manhattan, and also from the, uh, when Manhattan was formed. Even if you look at different winter, spring, summer, fall, mid-continental climate, here's all the variation that goes on. Um, I might see if I can miss my plane tomorrow since I have 13 inches of snow right now on the ground. But basically, what this graph show is that we're getting this potential warming effect. Uh, the area around Manhattan has shown a positive warming uh, over this day. And why is that important? If you look at photosynthesis rate of junipers from uh, November through March, they, they like it warm. You can imagine any days above zero, particularly in the wintertime, they're an evergreen, they're able to put on carbon. So if we have an ever-changing warming climate, we're going to favor junipers. We'll probably never be able, the junipers aren't going to be able to match the C4 plants. That's a different photosynthetic pathway. They like it hot, but as you can tell, come the first little hint of anything cool, they shut down where the junipers can literally be putting on carbon year round. And so this could be important on that growing season. What's gonna to happen to this particular growing season average over time as that climate continues to warm? And then finally, although it's hard to imagine, again, uh, using some data, I have to constantly remind myself, I went to Kanza um, in the early 80s, and I have never really experienced a drought situation. The data suggests from 1980 up to about 99 when this data is done, is that this part of the world has seen relatively higher precip than if you look at the 100 year normal. Other places have shown no increased precipitation. So we set up the perfect storm right here during a time. And so as Sam says, what's going to happen now, particularly uh, in those areas where we have a high cedar concentration, are we going to start having these catastrophic fires that Texas has experienced? And in fact, being in charge of the fire at Conza Prairie, I talked to uh, the fire people uh, more than I really care to want to talk to them. And I've, with the Riley County Fire Response Team. And that subdivision that I showed you earlier is now on their radar screen. They have a fire plan how to handle that fire that ever spreads in that because that's a very closed canopy situation and they're worried that if we do have a decrease in the precipitation that they're setting up an example for fire these are very expensive homes as i said they run me out every night they won't let me in that uh, subdivision at nighttime and so this is a a high impact area that has some potential changes on that and which is why the control of red cedars is going to become even more critical and then finally uh, this is just some made up uh, stuff and I could go either way on this but I think of these are future directions or some hypotheses. what's going to happen again when we go from this C4 grasslands to junipers in this ever changing environment uh, the plus is just means that the C4 grasslands they like it hot they're going to like the summer temperature winter they really it's not going to uh, impact them and you can see along this juniper forest how many of these things are in the positive realm on that particularly going with bonds uh, favorite hypothesis co2 
Both of these woody plants, RC3, uh, they're going to favor this elevated CO2. This increased nitrogen deposition that I very seldom uh, mention in my talk, we are, people think of increased nitrogen deposition occurring mostly in the Northeast. Based upon our 30 plus years of data at Kanza, away from any manufacturing area, not a high population area, we are seeing an increase in nitrogen deposition. And what impact will that have? We know from Tillman's work up in Minnesota, you start adding nitrogen, heavy doses of nitrogen to a prairie, you change it. And very seldom can you change it back. You can't simply put it into fire. It just doesn't respond. We know juniper is really accumulates that nitrogen, so we might get an increase on that. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll end up with what I hope we see more of. This is a, a lone cedar tree out on Kanza that uh, the bison, after they were reintroduced to it, kind of wiped it out. Um, and uh, that's my one positive note from this is getting rid of at least one cedar tree on that. So uh, with that, I'd, I'd take any questions. <laughs>